Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. Yeah, I left the Gary V stuff on. Um, anyway, um, let's get right into doing some wine here. There's no housekeeping to do. Uh, this is I did it all last show and uh, I got lunch to eat, man, and I'm getting hungry and I gotta get through a couple wines here. Not that they're gonna get any less attention than any other wines, but let's just get right into doing the wine. So wine number one is the 2013 so I didn't get something old. Uh, 2013 Alexander Valley Vineyards Cabernet Franc. I love this grape. Though I think I think in my head I love it more than I probably do. But I've had some really good Cab Francs, and so I think it's just I'm trying to be uber cool or something like that. That you know Cab Franc, I love Cab Franc, but I do I like it. Anyway, so let's get right into it. Um, Alexander Valley Vineyards. So they're in the Alexander Valley AVA of Sonoma. Remember that? Remember that little area that. That makes wine called Sonoma. Yeah. They make good wine there too. It's not just Napa in California. And it's not just Napa and Sonoma. It's lots of places. As we're going to taste, I believe this place is. No, I think these, I think, he, you know, no, this is not Napa. That's right. It's near Napa where they get their grapes. Anyway, little rinse. All right. I wonder if I'm getting near the end of this gas cap seal. Anyway, uh, so the Alexander Valley region is named for Cyrus Alexander. Now, he got there in the 1800s, the early 1800s, and um, he was, uh, he also kind of brought in some cuttings and all the stuff, stuff. He did some. As I get wine all over my piece of paper here. Um, he brought he started doing grape growing in there. So um, he was owner of the part of Rancho Sotoyome Mexican Land Grant in 1847. And the AVA was granted its uh, status, AVA status, in uh, 1984. Um, so yeah, he he was there early on, got a land grant. Um, and uh, is pretty instrumental in the whole area of starting a whole bunch of stuff. Anyway, um, so uh, this area is just north of Healdsburg in Sonoma County. It's home to many wineries and vineyards as well as the city of Cloverdale. Uh, it is the largest and most fully planted wine region in Sonoma. Um, the Russian River flows down the valley surrounded by vineyards on both sides. Uh, it was mostly prune orchards and pastures when in 1962 Maggie... Um, and Harry Wetzel purchased a large portion of the homestead built by Cyrus. Um, and uh, let's see. So they settled there. Uh, they raised livestock, cultivated bountiful gardens, and restored Alexander's original home, making it the center of family life. In 63, the Wetzels boldly planted premium grape varieties. Among the first in the area, they sold the grapes for a number of years to other wineries then and then often produce a little homemade wine uh, for themselves. Uh, they bottled their first vintage of AVV Cab Sauv in 68, but this wine was only given to friends and family. It was 1975 that they built a small winery, and Hank Wetzel, the oldest son, uh, produced the AVV's first actual vintage of 75 wine. Um, his wife, Linda, set up books and managed the winery office. So this is 100% Cab. And then they talk about that 2013 was an almost perfect growing season. began with one of the driest springs on record. Uh, they had a warm growing season about the summer. Uh, they reached peak maturity about two weeks earlier than they did the year prior. Um, after harvest, they were fermented in smaller tanks. Uh, they said they got good con they got, got good extraction and concentrated flavors. They did pump overs twice daily for two weeks. 
And then the wine was aged in 100% French oak uh, for 16 months. What's a pump over? So as the wine is fermenting, you get this cap. All, you get the grape skins and all the, all the crap. It starts flowing to the top. You get this cap. Um, and what they do is to try to keep, you know, to try to keep all that good stuff to interact with all the juice in the bottom. One of the things you do is called a pump over. So you get, you have a, you have a pump and it takes wine from the bottom and pumps it over onto the cap and the cap and the cap gets forced down into the juice. Okay. Um, you can also have punch downs do the same thing. You actually take a physical thing and you punch everything down. So there's different ways to do it. And some people don't do it. Don't do that at all. Pretty rare though, I think. All right, so um, I did start the, I did start this, didn't I? I think I did. Yeah, I did. All right. So let's get right. Oh, did I say how much I paid for it? No, I didn't. Um, I paid twenty one dollars at Underground Sellers. It normally sells for twenty eight. So this is part of a deal that I only paid twenty one dollars for. And let's get right into it. Let's see if I can go a little bit faster. All right, this wine is clear, has, well, not clear, has no evidence of gas, no evidence of sediment. It is opaque. It is not clear. Um, it is, I don't want to call it bright. Red wines have a problem with that. Um, anyway, um, concentration, and um, it is no, no rim variation. Um, it is purple. I mean, it has a little bit of rim variation to the edge, but it's pretty much all the way to the edge. Um, there is some slight staining of the glass that indicates some extraction. Um, and it also could indicate a warmer climate. Uh, viscosity and tears. Viscosity is medium. On the nose, um, it is clean, no evidence of any faults. Um, it is moderate intensity. It does, it does smell youthful. The first thing that does come out to me is non-fruit characteristics. I do get the bane of all Cabernet Sauvignons, uh, green pepper. I do get some white black pepper. I don't get a lot of fruit characteristics. It's my weakness. I, I key in too much on it to your aroma. I do get savoriness out of it. Smoked meats, be, uh, beef jerky. Cedar box. Very little fruit on the nose. Evidence of wood with the uh, spices, but not much else. On the palate, tannins are medium plus. Um, no, I'll go medium. Not really a whole lot of tannins. Acid feels very, I wouldn't say medium plus. No, I'm going to go high on the acid. My mouth is watering a lot. Um, alcohol does not feel too terribly high, um, but we're going to call it medium plus. Confused on that. Um it is full-bodied wine. Um, it is dry. Um, it is definitely a dry wine, bone dry. Um, palate does somewhat confirm the nose. Um, I do get the same smokiness, meatiness, um, peppers, uh, the, the, the green pepper, black and white pepper, um, cedar box, potpourri. On the nose, I also get some more, ooh, I'm starting to get some chocolate on the nose.
The wine is very vegetal in character. I do get maybe, no, no, no more maybes. I do get a little bit of um, hints of red fruit, but nothing specific. Um, it does feel balanced. I'm right about the same point again. Um, it does feel balanced. Come on, go away. Um, the length is moderate, medium plus, and um, it has good complexity. Uh, it does feel like a from quality producer. And then at this point, um, old world, new world, all that stuff. Now, is it good wine? Yeah, this is good wine. I like this wine. It also, I, you know, because I, I, it, I know in my head, I know it's Cab Franc, and if I get the greenness, it's supposed to be in there. But I know a lot of winemakers try to get rid of the greenness. But this is 2013, which um, even though they say they had um, a warm summer, um, I guess in Napa, 13 was, no, not that, it was 11. Um, Usually you get the greenness from cooler vintages. So let's see what they say in the back. Warm days, blah, 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 blah. So they say there's black, there's blueberries, blackberries, mocha, and spice. Yeah, maybe the mocha is why I got the chocolatey stuff. Velvety texture and long finish. Yeah, see, I don't get any of that stuff. But I might be a little more sensitive to, to bell pepper than others. I get a lot of spiciness. I really don't get any fruit, but I like it. I like the wine. It's right up my alley type of flavor profile that I like. Um, I think it's good wine. And at how much I pay for this? $21? Normally $28? It's worth it. I think it's a really good wine. All right. Moving on to wine number two. All right, wine number two is a is the 2007 um, Forlorn Hope Gascony Cadets from the King Andrews Vineyard, Suisun Valley Petite Verdot. Bought this also through Underground Cellar. Um, paid nineteen dollars for it. So that meant I got some other wine that was 19 bucks, and this normally sells for 42. So this is one of those where I got I got a deal. I am starting to think. Well, no, I I, I heard the gas come out, so it just feels like it's getting weak in there. Whoops. So maybe maybe the needle's getting. No, I would normally hear the little gas escaping if the needle wasn't wasn't. Um, which we'll call it tight on there. But then again, I also have noticed that the first couple presses are really difficult, but then once you get some displacement, um, you really get some good gas in there and the flow comes out pretty good. All right, that's good enough. All right. I wonder if this is actually a, a wood wood cork or it's a composite or something like that because it really came, it went in and out really easily. All right. So who are these guys? Uh, there's probably a lot of wine there. Uh, King Andrews Vineyards. Sorry, I'm busy right now. Um, go away. Uh, King. I know I have a phone call. The computer wants to go tell me I have a phone call. Uh, King Andrew Vineyards, Suisun Valley Petit Verdot, uh, taken from the Dutch Verulen Hoop. That's Forlorn Hope. Why are you on? What? Go away. The little webcam light came on. No, we're not doing FaceTime. Uh, meaning lost troops. So forlorn hope. Verloren hope or hoop in the Dutch. Uh, was named given to the band of soldiers who volunteered to lead the charge directly into enemy defenses. The chance of success of the forlorn hope was always slim, but the glory and rewards granted to, to the survivors ensured no shortage of applicants. Uh, these bottles... The first produced by Matthew Rorick Wines, that's who produces this, um, were our headlong rush into the breach. 
Rare creatures from Appalachians unknown and varieties uncommon. That's why he uses Petit Verdot and where the Appalachian is, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, these wines are our brave advanced party, our pride and joy, our forlorn hope. Okay, anyway, that's the rest of the marketing. Um, then uh, this is more about the philosophy. We believe very strongly that the site and farming uh, that sight and farming produce all that we should like to find in a bottle of wine, and we don't want to confuse or muddy the story that each wine can relate by adding water or yeast or acid or enzymes that had nothing at all to do with what the vines put into each of our clusters. So let's talk about that real quick. So winemakers don't like to talk about this a lot, but I've been reading this, I mean, I've been listening to this awesome podcast Inside Winemaking by Jim Duane. Uh, he works for CV Vineyards. He's the winemaker there. And he interviews a lot of winemakers. Also he's interviewed, you know, people who deal with who, Coopers. He's dealt with cork guys, um, all this stuff. So he, if you're in the industry, yet yeah, another podcast you should be listening to. Um, you know, you've got you've got Levy Dalton with All Drink to That, uh, who you know, also interviews winemakers and winery owners. But he also interviews psalms and importers and just you know all these great personalities in the wine industry um whereas jim is really focused on the wine making and everything associated with the wine making part of things um but anyway uh so you know if, if you know when you're doing your fermentation and it, whether the whether the harvest was great or not if if the wine's not quite make, going in the direction you want to go in, you can do things like add some water if it's getting too alcoholic. Um, you can. Uh, it's very common to add yeast instead of having a natural, you know, having it all native yeast, um, which there are some people say that doesn't exist, and other people say it does. I had lunch recently with a um, a winery person, and they said that they that um, some lab confirmed that everything was 100% native yeast from the beginning to end. Um, so, um, there was no other, you know, there was no, you know, all the, all the yeast came from the vineyard or came from the, came from the grapes, uh, adding acid or enzymes. Um, these are things that yes, you can, you can acidify your wine. If it's, if it's getting a little flabby, if you need to add some, some acid to it, enzymes help you with, uh, other things. Um, also with malolactic fermentation, since that's a bacteria and not a yeast, as I, for some reason, kept thinking it was a yeast. Um, so you, you, there's stuff you can do to the wine to mold it to what you want. Um, even if, you know, or enhance maybe the character of, you know, the vineyards that you're using, but sometimes it needs a little push, needs a little help. And sometimes it's just flat out, you're making bulk wine and you want it to taste exactly the same every single time, like a Coca-Cola and you do everything you can to, to make it look, smell, and taste the same every single year. You might as well not even put a vintage on it because it's not going to be very much different. All right. Um, every, each of the Forlorn Hope Wipes wines may be put through very different fermentations en route to becoming one of our rare creatures. Um, so they do have different fermentation philosophies depending on the grape variety or where the grapes are coming. I'm not, not going to go through all of them because they don't mention Petit Verdot specifically. No new barrels are ever used. Uh, currently, our oldest 60-gallon vessels are from the 1997 vintage. Um, see, grapes come from the King Andrews Vineyards in Suisun Valley, east of Napa Valley. It is the second oldest AVA in California behind Napa, um, which I did not know that. I really had never heard of this AVA um, because we so focus on you know, Napa and Sonoma. And then after that, we start talking about Paso Robles or Paso Robles. I keep hearing people say both of them and they are from California. So Paso Robles, I'll say because it's, you know, I'm, I live in Texas and that's the Spanish pronunciation ish kind of maybe sort of. Um, and so we talk about that. We talk about a whole bunch of other places, um, but never Suisun Valley, S-U-I-S-U-N. Anyway, um, and it's like, it butts up against Napa on the east. Yeah, east to how you're looking, I think. I don't know. Anyway, yes, opposite of what I'm looking at. Um, it's right there. All right, let's check it out. Boom. All right, this wine is uh, has no gas, no evidence of any sediment that I can see. Uh, it is opaque. Um, it is a deep, that's what I'm supposed to say, concentration. It is a deep, deep garnet, sure, 
I really have a problem between identifying between garnet, purple, and red and all that stuff. They all look kind of the same to me. All right, but we'll so call it garnet. Um, yeah, call it garnet. Um, no rim variation. Um, does not appear to be very much staining of the glass. Not a lot of extraction. Um, viscosity is low, which might indicate lower alcohol, which again, we still have to check the alcohol on these guys. On the nose, uh, no evidence of any faults. It does smell clean. It is of low intensity. Let's see here, seven. Does not smell youthful. Um, first thing I get is more earthiness. I get earthiness on the nose. Wet earth, almost, you know, manure. Not barnyard, but, you know, definitely get um, out in the field. No evidence of, I don't want to get any, any type of fruit characteristics at all on the nose. And really no evidence of wood aging. I don't get a whole lot out of the nose. It just smells kind of earthy and that's about it. On the palate, it is bone dry. Tannins are low. Acid is high. Alcohol is low or medium minus. It, it, there's really not a lot of burn. Um, it is of medium minus body. Maybe alcohol is more medium. I do feel a little bit of burn, but not a lot. Um, on the palate, tastes like wine. I would be completely stumped on this. I, I don't get, I really don't get anything. Hmm. Yeah, the palate and the and the and the nose are fairly the same, but it's very slight. I don't. I get maybe. Don't use maybe anymore. I get. You know what? As I taste a little more, I get some slight fruit characteristic, but it's very minimal. Um, black fruit. Yeah, I get some black fruit on it. If I, as, I, as I taste a little longer, the length is, is actually decent. Um, it's medium plus. Um, so again, we're right at the same thing. No items of wood. Um, it's balanced in the sense that nothing really stands out. Um, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have a, a chemical or, or processed um, type of, of uh, palate. So it, it feels, you know, so it's not a bulk wine. So it's of a quality producer. Um, it has medium complexity, um, medium to medium plus finish. Um, it's just, it's very close. It doesn't have, it doesn't bring a lot to the, to the party here. If I paid $42 for this bottle of wine, I probably would not be very happy. I, I just... I like it. It tastes good for a $19 bottle of wine. But maybe this is something where if I have a if I have, if I have some food with it, it's going to be rock it's going to be a rock star. It's going to really bring out some some uh, flavors and aromas with food, but I, right now 
but I could drink it. You know, this is weird. I could drink this wine. Like I could sit back and just kind of sip on it, you know, not really put food with it. Um, but it's, it's a lot of hints of, but nothing just comes right out at you. Maybe it's just because this particular vintage, a 2007 Petit Verdot, you know, we're talking, you know, eight, what, uh, nine years later. Maybe it's just, it's past its prime. You know, maybe if we had something that was three or four years older, I mean, three or four years old, uh, or one to two years old, since he doesn't really age in oak. Um, I don't know, but it's not an unpleasant wine, but if you told me it was a $42 bottle of wine, I'd be like, well, yeah, kind of, you know, 20 bucks and under, yeah. Yeah. I don't give it a recommendation to buy this exact vintage at $42. I'd have to taste another one. And, um, you know, Matthew, I, I, I don't like, I'm not trying to pan the wine, but I don't like saying I don't, that I don't think the wine is worth what it is or whatever it is. This might've been a great wine a few years ago. So again, this also a, um, this is also a, um, a drawback of buying from underground sellers because this is very much likely a wine that they had, you know, that the winery had said, we just got to get rid of it. So we'll sell it. And, you know, I got a bottle of it. Um, and they're just going to recoup as much, they, as much money as they can. If it normally sells for 42 and I bought it for 19, I have no idea what underground sellers business model is, how they can afford to, you know, sell these expensive bottles for like 19 bucks. So somewhere along the line, they've got to be, you know, a bottle that's costing me 19 probably cost them a lot less and they're going to, they're going to make their profit on that. And then they're going to take a loss on the more expensive wines. And I'm not saying they paid $19 for this bottle of wine. You know, they might've paid, they might've paid, I don't know, 20 to $30 for it, but they're going to make enough money profit wise on the other stuff to make up for the loss of selling this for $19. I don't know. I would like to get, I think his name is Jeff on the podcast to talk about how they make money. And I don't mean they need to open their books, we need to inspect it, but just kind of get an idea. How do you make money by, by doing it? Especially when I see like, when I talked about last week, the offer was $20 for, for, for wine, and you can buy multiple bottles at 20 bucks, and, but the, you, you actually have a, great, you have a great chance of upgrade of your of two bottles, the upgrade being the $28 bottle. But you're only paying 20 bucks for it. So that's where, you know, I kind of when 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 the upgrades are more likely than the than the low end, where are you making your money from? So I don't know. It's an okay wine. I'll I'll enjoy drinking it, I'm sure. Um, but I will I won't be taking it seriously. I won't be like, you know, and maybe, maybe, you know, if I if it opened up a little more, maybe it interacted with the oxygen, it would release all these wonderful aromas and flavors. But right now. It didn't, I didn't get anything out of it. All right, so that's going to do it for this episode. Um, as always, thank you for stopping by. Click the links above to friend me up. Hit the link over there to send Duckus so I can buy more $42 wine for $19. Um, and um, leave comments below. And uh, leave great ratings at iTunes. Listen to that podcast from Jim Duane, uh, Inside Winemaking. Um, on iTunes and Levy's also. And that's it. We'll see everyone again next time.